Okay, welcome everybody to our Connecting uh, with Nature webinar series every Wednesday. Um, we've been putting on a different webinar because we know that the people um, have been locked down for so long and um, we just would like to still be able to connect with nature. So this is our opportunity to um, connect with nature from different people's perspective in their own little backyard or what they're interested in. Um, just before we start today, I'd like to do an acknowledgement to country. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians and the land on which we work and live. And for myself, it is the Darkinjan people of the Darkinjan nation. And we recognize their continuing connection to land, water and community. And we pay our respect to elders past, present and emerging. All right, so today's topic um, is getting technical with nature photography. And this is gonna be with our executive officer, Gary Dunnett. Now, just before we kick off, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. We anticipate that the session will go for approximately an hour. Sometimes um, it might go a little bit over an hour if um, you know the presenter gets right into it and has a lot to convey, and particularly if there's lots of questions. Um, just letting everybody know that it will be recorded. We're recording right now. Um, and you are actually able to go back and look at our previous webinars or any webinars that you miss by just checking out our website. Um, just in terms of how we are gonna structure this, we're gonna um, get Gary to talk his whole presentation and then we're gonna have questions at the end. So I need you guys to type the questions into the question box down the bottom. Um, so I'll only be checking that for questions. Sometimes people get a bit confused, but there's also a chat box. So the chat box is for anybody who'd like to, you know, just have a chat about what we're, you know, what's being discussed, what Gary's talking about at the time. But I won't be looking there specifically for questions at the end. Alrighty, um, I might hand over to Gary now. Thanks, Shani. And look, I'd likewise like to acknowledge uh, that we're meeting on Aboriginal land. I, I personally live on land of the Dharawal Nation. Um, now I'm just going to stop one share and kick off another. And hopefully that's working. Okay, that's a good spot to sit. Um, look at today's presentation is two things. One is that um, it, it's filling a gap in the roster. So uh, <laughs> we, we, we had carefully planned out the next several presentations, but there was a strange gap, which was today. And so um, I'd, I'd agree to come in and sort of talk to you today. Uh, and the other thing is that um, it's deliberately a little bit subversive. Um, I think the term uh, technology or what was it? Getting into the technical nitty gritty of nature photography was in the in the title of this, but in truth, what I really want to do is to um, give everyone the confidence to use whatever camera they actually have. You know, you can do amazing things with the most basic of cameras. And in a world where we all go to YouTube, the sort of technical direction, what we increasingly find is people spruiking us sort of, you know, upselling on every level and there's really no need for it. So today I really just want to sort of touch on some of the basics. So look, in the spirit of local living, you know, um, within our own LGA as it were, we really don't want to start from any sort of silly idea that nature photography is all about, you know, big cats hunting on the African plains or double rainbows over Uluru. Um, you don't need plane tickets. You don't need tanks full of diesel to experience nature. Um, so what I really just want to start with is just a quick run through of the backyard, um, basically 100 metres around our place, just to give you a bit of a sense of the, the depth and complexity of what sits at our own doorstep. So everyone in Sydney, certainly, and, so, and along most of the East Coast will have heard those sort of screeching yowlings during the night, which is these folks, which is the grey-headed flying fox. And apologies, I'm just reminding myself how to operate. Oops. We will get there. Right, there's the little triangle. Um, and the other bit of nightly yowling you often hear is the brush tail possums having a bit of a squabble. This one's in that absolute classic of Sydney trees, the, the Angophora. Um, 
and against the moon. The other really common um, possum of our sort of urban gardens is the ringtail, um, which has got the lovely white tail. And uh, instead of nesting in a hollow like the, the brush tails do, these folks create what they call a dray, which is a little sort of a mass of leaves that looks a bit like an untidy bird's nest. Um, I'm really lucky. I, I live next to a little bushland reserve. And so as well as the brush tiles and the, um, uh, and the ring tiles, we also get sugar gliders. And this one's sort of feeding on a gymere lily. Every couple of years, we, um, our place gets a little horde of brown antichinus invading the house. Um, they're basically a miniature, miniature little quoll. You can think about them, but they're unbelievably athletic. So they literally race up the walls and will actually race across the roof, hanging upside down. They're just the most amazing things. Um, they love cockroaches, so not too fussed about having them in the house. To get the occasional daytime uh, mammal. So this is the, the echidna, which sort of about every six months we'll see one in the backyard. Um, but much more commonly, it's, the, it's actually the birds that are the dominant ones. So this is the tawny frog mouth on the hill's hoist. And last year, this pair of tawny frog mouths decided to bring their, their babies or their juveniles just outside my home office. Um, for about four months, they were sort of sitting there as the, as the youngsters got larger and larger. Uh, and this was only a few days ago. It's a kitchen window where the, the rotten currawongs are also trying to nest in the backyard and they'd chase this poor old, um, I think it's the male tawny frogmouth who'd sort of come and nestled against the kitchen window. Um, I, I thought this was in the grand tradition of still life with frogmouth. Uh, we also get powerful owls. This is a juvenile. Lots of various sorts of songbirds. This is my personal favourite, the, the grey butcher bird. Uh, nesting in a lemon tree. So, you know, we, we don't have to draw these sharp divides between, uh, if you like, natural nature, endemic nature, indigenous nature, and um, the natural places that we create around us. And this is a wonga pigeon in the backyard. It's a sort of supposed, mostly a rainforest pigeon, but they also get around the sort of the wetter edges of the urban areas. Kookaburras. Um, lots of people on the East Coast will be having regular encounters with um, king parrots. They're just the most stately sort of animals, just extraordinary creatures. Um, this was a few days ago, or a couple of weeks ago, actually, a diamond python sort of coming out onto the veranda with, um, with the, the warmth of the sort of spring coming around. And you know those nights like the last, the last few during the week where you get the brown toadlets just going off their head. This is just in the sort of the drain next to the house. These little folk are only about two or three centimetres long at the maximum. Um, incredibly variable in their colouring, but what's not variable <laughs> is that um, incessant calling, which uh, builds a, a volume that you wouldn't expect from something that size. And a little Lesieur's gecko. Um, this one was in the garage. That's why it's on a brick. Christmas beetles on, the, uh, on a table on the veranda. You know, when you walk across the, the front lawn and you get that face full of web, that's the, usually the garden orb weaver, which is these, in this case, you get a, size, a sense of the size of this big female from the fact that it's actually captured a Christmas beetle. And these are my favorite amongst the spiders, the little jumping spiders, lots and lots of different species. This one's on the lemon tree, um, but because, you know, as humans, we react to big eyes and that connection that you get from these things, they stare straight at you um, and you can choose whether it's the outer eyes that you're looking at or the big ones, but either way, it sort of feels as, uh, as though someone is looking at you. Um, and look, I know that they're not to everyone's taste, but this is a bit of a rockery next to the, um, the back door and the funnel webs seem to do okay in there. Praying mantis, again, another species that sort of loves urban yards. 
This is a thing called a neon cuckoo bee. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a parasitic bee. It, it lays its eggs in the nests of other native bees. This one's on a lavender. And they have these extraordinary mouthpieces that they use to extract the nectar. And in this case, you can see it's actually cleaning its mouthpiece. It's, it doesn't normally stick out that far. It's this extraordinary sort of hinged apparatus, but it's giving it a good clean there. The more common native bee that you see um, in New South Wales is these blue banded bees. They're about a similar size to the, the classic sort of European bee, but uh, tend to be much quicker. Um, it's, it's not all about animals. Um, this is just a, a drop of water on a, on a rocky shelf, again, next to my home office. Some of the sun orchids just down the hill. Um, if, if there's a species that for me characterizes Sydney, it's the smooth bark apple, the, the Angophora costata. Um, they're just the most spectacular trees, you know, to have, well, in their season orange, but um, for much of the year, pink trees surrounding you is just the most extraordinary thing. Uh, and they're not bad as the sun goes down either. And of course, much of the nature around us isn't necessarily native species. You know, this is a bird of paradise plant um, and a bit of jiggery pokery with, you know, Photoshop and whatnot. But, um, and sometimes the nature's even inside. This is just the Siamese fighting fish that one of my kids has downstairs. So look, I've just run through that to give it a little bit of a sense of you know, it, it's a pretty broad canvas when we talk about nature photography. Um, and the truth is that, especially with the emergence of digital photography, taking photographs has just become totally ubiquitous. And, you know, we've got a couple of generations who seem absolutely determined to document their whole lives for prosperity um, through a camera lens. So we're all used to it. But even so, there's some sort of, I guess, technical basics that can help us do a better job with much of our photography. And, and the fundamental starting point is that, you know, the, the basic process of photography is uh, exposing a light sensitive surface to light. In the old days, that used to be a plate of uh, film or later a, a roll of film. Um, which was light sensitive. Um, now it's a, it's a camera sensor, but the fundamentals stay the same. And so there's what they refer to as an exposure triangle, which actually gives us a bit of a guide to uh, what are the factors that influence how much light gets onto that sensor and how do we make sure that we're balancing them in such a way that we get a correct exposure. It's neither too bright nor too dark. And as with all life, what are the compromises that we make along the way? So I'm gonna to touch on a couple of those compromises, but one of them's what's referred to as aperture. So that's essentially how big the hole is that the light gets to travel through between the lens and the sensor. And pretty obviously, the bigger that hole, the larger the aperture, the more light comes through. The smaller the hole, the less light comes through. But interestingly, there's also an optical phenomena with aperture. And that is that when you have a really small hole, you get a greater depth of field, more of the images in focus than when you have a really large aperture. Um, so that's actually really important because it gives us a mechanism for making a creative decision about whether you just want to have a narrow plane of focus or you want to have a lot of the photograph actually in focus. Um, we'll get to it later, but, you know, the aperture is not made easier by the fact that it's actually got a backward scale. So a high aperture number, like, say, an f22 is actually a very, very small hole and a large aperture like f2.8 is actually a very large hole. So it's a little bit backwards, but it's because it's actually a, it's a ratio. So what you're actually dealing with is an inverse uh, relationship rather than a, um, a direct one. So aperture is part of what 
we can use to juggle the amount of light, whether it's a big hole or a small hole. Um, shutter speed is the other, another thing that allows us to juggle the amount of light. You can have an aperture that's open for a long time or a short time. And clearly, the longer it's open, the more light is going to end up on the sensor. But of course, the longer it's open, the more likelihood that your subject will move. And so you'll get blur or even that you'll move. So, you know, just the natural shaking of your hand, um, we've all got it. And uh, it will actually create what's referred to as motion blur. And then the third part, so it's, again, there is a creative decision there. Sometimes you actually want to show that expression of movement, you know, for instance, the tips of a bird's wing. Um, and other times you're looking to have something that's absolutely rock solid. It just looks like that instant in time and it's got absolute clarity and sharpness. So shutter speed is also important. And you can see just between the size of the hole and how much, how long the hole is open, that you've got two really critical variables. The third one that's increasingly important is what's called ISO, which is simply the sensitivity of the sensor. Now, in the old days, you used to have to make a decision when you started and put a roll of film into a camera about how sensitive that, that film was. And as with everything, there was a trade-off. So the more sensitive it was, generally that meant that the particle sizes of the chemical were larger, and so the final image tended to be grainier. Um, Bizarrely, we've ended up in exactly the same situation when it comes to electronic sensors in that although that you'll see cameras advertised that will tell you they've got an ISO of more than a million, um, but their base ISO may be only 100, uh, what's happening is that there's really only the base ISO and everything else is based off algorithms that amplify the, the um, the signal that's gone to that sensor. And the more you amplify, the more chance there is of error. And as a consequence, the higher the ISO, the grainier it ends up looking. So we've ended up in the same sort of situation as we have had with film photography. And so around this triangle, you're constantly trying to juggle the sensitivity of the sensor with the dimensions of the aperture with how long the shutter is actually opening, open to try and actually get the right exposure. And the fantastic news is that all, and I really do mean all of the cameras that are on the market now, can do that business automatically. So at one level, you can just trust to the cameras to do that piece. But what we have is the opportunity to make deliberate decisions to to push the ratios between those three sides of the exposure triangle in a particular direction. So we can make a decision, for instance, that it's more important in this particular image to have a, a large depth of field, to keep everything in focus, knowing that that means that we'll have to bump up the ISO and we might have to allow a longer shutter speed. Or we could be saying, we really want the, the action to be captured really sharply, frozen action. So we'll accept that the depth of field isn't so high and we might, again, might have a higher ISO, a bit more graininess. So, sorry, it really doesn't like me stopping. I'm just gonna have to go back and reshare. Apologies for this, it's the technology just having a little think. Okay, seems just gonna share screen. Oh goodness. Oh, here we go. Okay, where are we? Ah. Sorry about this. It will, should just take a second to.
All right. I now know that I can't afford to leave the, uh, the screen set in any one place for more than an instant. So look, that, that, that exposure triangle is a really important piece of the, the, the background. The other thing is that you'll see a lot of talk and a lot of confusion around um, different categories of camera. So what they call full frame, crop sensor or APS-C, micro four thirds, and then phones, which are um, a new and emerging category all in of themselves. And look, the, all this, um, this image is really saying is that those different categories all have different size of sensor. Shana, can you just confirm whether you've got the whole screen or just the... Um, no, it's not in a full screen, actually. Okay. Oh. Hopefully it is. It should, yeah. yeah, that should be all right now, I think. All right. Okay. Yeah. okay. Apologies, everyone. Um, so basically, in terms of image quality, the larger the sensor, the easier it is to capture lots of light and it makes it vastly easier. So even though you can have a full frame camera that might be say a 40 megapixel resolution, you can have a phone that tells you that it's a 40 megapixel resolution, but the reality is the sensors are vastly different sizes. And so um, the phones are fantastic, but they just can't capture the same amount of light and they can't get quite the same image quality as the full frame. Okay, excuse me. <coughs> All right, so look, I just wanna quickly run through um, another critical concept which is focal length. So part of the equation here is that the size of the, the lens, the way the lens represents the world varies. And so you start at what's referred to as a wide end, which is something like a 20 mil. So this is a tree out the backyard, um, 24 mil lens, 35, 50, 85, 105, 120, 200, 300. All the same tree, but they're all getting represented in very different ways because the lens is actually basically doing more or less sort of telescoping as it were to, to give you an image. So you have to make a decision about what sort of, oh, there you go. I got ahead of myself, so that's the 300 end. Um, so the focal length is a really important part of how your image looks. And in a couple of minutes, we'll get to what that means in terms of the different cameras that are available to us. But in practical terms, we have, if you like, the landscape end of things, which is, you know, your, your classic image of big space, big sky, in this case, a bit of sea as well. Or this is a... Botany Bay, the, the seaside sculptures at Botany Bay. These are both 20 millimetre images. So they're at the wide end. And then you have the telephoto end. This is a little scarlet honey eater. They're only sort of six or seven centimetres long. One of the, well, smallest honey eater in Australia and one of the smallest birds. Um, but sometimes they're actually quite large things, but they're just a long way away. So, you know, this is a 40 ton uh, humpback whale at a distance off Kame, I think. And sometimes that you can use a telephoto lens for things that aren't even animate. Okay, so the focal length determines how, if you like, how telescopic, but there's another aspect of it, which is it actually changes the angle of view. So what I want you to look at here, this rock in the foreground, this is a wide angle shot. So in this case, the rock looks really big. And in fact, the background looks small, but as we, increase the focal length, you'll see that that relationship between that rock, which is sort of staying at roughly the same size and the background, because I'm moving forward, changes quite radically. And what we're seeing here is that, of course, we can move backwards and forwards with a lens to optimize our viewpoint, but the the focal length you choose makes a real big difference in 
how you actually create a relationship between the things that are close to you and the things that are further away. So the longer the focal length tends to compress scenes and the shorter the focal length actually uh, opens them up. And in practical terms, um, this is a, you know, it's, it's a local creek. That fern is not really larger than the trees, but because I've got, I'm in close to it and I'm using a wide angle, it exaggerates the size of the fern in relation to the surrounding rainforest. Likewise, sort of some, some roots in front of a creek. Um, whereas this shot up at the Warren Bungles with a telephoto lens, part of the reason it works is that you've got this extraordinary compression of the layers, but you've also got the different tones because of the distance between them. And so it's, it's that sort of incongruous nature of it, if you like, that you've got, your eyes are telling you that these things are stacked up, but it, you know, the, the different amount of haze is telling you that actually they're at a distance. All right, so that's a lot of backwards and forwards on all this stuff to do with focal lens. The rubber hits the road when it actually gets to the point where we have to make a decision about what we're actually dealing with in terms of the equipment we've got. Um, and I'm just going to focus in on the most common sort of pieces of kit people have. So, you know, at one end, you've got what they refer to as the full frame cameras with their kit lenses, um, which tend to be in the region of 24 to let's call it 100 millimeters. Um, the crop sensor cameras, which come with an 18 to 55. And because the sensor is smaller, that needs to be um, adjusted to account for the, the mathematical relationship between the sensor and the lens. And so it actually ends up being much the same. Um, there were a whole generation of compact cameras. And when you account for the sensor size, they again came out much the same. And in fact, even the phones that we've got at the moment take you from high teens through to about 70 millimetres. Um, yes, they do go a little bit wider than most of the cameras, but that's because people want to be able to hold a phone near their face to photograph themselves. And so they need that wider angle, otherwise they just won't fit everything in basically. But the upshot is that any of the tools that are available to you, uh, hovering around that standard um, perspective of somewhere between uh, 24 millimetres and about 70, our eyes naturally sit at about 50 millimetres. Um, and so you're just going a little bit wider than the natural eye to a little bit longer. And all of these readily available tools all give you that same perspective. And what it means is that the cameras that are most accessible to us are in fact the ones that give us views that are very similar to what we experience ourselves. They're not distorting the world very much. Um, just <coughs> one thing that uh, a lot of people get really caught up in the, the, uh, the reviews on YouTube and in blogs and whatnot, which will all try and push you down into the, the high end. Um, and convince you that what you need is actually the extremes. In reality, the very best lenses that are available are what they refer to as the, the nifty 50 and the equivalents of that, which are the lenses that are closest to our natural eye. And because they're closest to our natural eye, they're actually optically the simplest of all the lenses. You know, on the left-hand side, we've got the number of elements, in other words, the, the components of the lens, you know, they're actually a whole series of individual lenses referred to as elements. And the, the, the nifty fifties have the least of all of the common focal lengths and they're far and away the lightest as well. So if you want to do yourself in terms of a favor, in terms of simplifying and reducing the weight of your gear, look for a 50 mil lens or its equivalent. And they're also far and away the easiest lenses to learn on. Um, when I started as a postgraduate student down in uh, Australian National University, the department I was in basically provided every um, postdoc, a uh, postgraduate student with two things: the either a, a plane ticket if you're going to the Pacific, or a the keys of a Land Cruiser if you worked in Australia, and I worked in Australia, and the other thing was a camera with a 50 mil lens on it. 
and that was to be used to do your record your field work and you were told to come back in 12 months and we'll see you in the lab but um they're extraordinarily uh versatile because they're very close to what we naturally see and because they're close to what we naturally see they um it's the most intuitive form of photography so we're very lucky that all of the the standard zooms that are available really only take you a few degrees either side of that natural perspective of the 50 mil lens but as i say if you if you if you want to get the sharpest possible lens for your system look for the 50 or the the equivalent so look that's a um there's a, there's a whole heap of stuff that sort of uh, we could go into more detail, but I actually just want to take a moment to, to actually put it into sort of practical effect. And for me, um, while again, much of the internet is really about the most extraordinary places on the planet and recording them, the real joy of photography is actually using it to interpret, engage with my local patch, you know, the places that I know reasonably well. And there's a lot of joy to be had in subjects that are really familiar. And there's, there's few things less familiar in New South Wales than the Waratah. And it just so happens that not far down the road, there's this spectacular bloom of Waratahs happening this year. Um, you know, it's a couple of years since it has a reduction uh, it, that tends to trigger mass flowerings um, and that's happening. And so I've been going back a few times to look at this stand of Waratahs. In this case, what we have in terms of that exposure triangle is a setting that's all in the middle. It's a, not an extreme shutter speed, it's not an extreme um, aperture, and it's a middle of the road sort of ISO. And it just gives you a, an image where the background and the subject are balanced. So they all look pretty much the same. But we can also manipulate that exposure triangle to our own ends. And in this case, you know, waratahs grow in, um, in the shrub layer of forest where you've got a lot going on in terms of a lot of shaded areas, complex patterning. And one of the easiest tricks in photography is in fact to make sure that the light is just following on your subject so that you're highlighting that subject. Um, now we clearly can't go out there with a, a huge, um, uh, we, we can't put any sort of obstacle between us and the sun very effectively, but what we can do is manipulate that exposure triangle so that the light element is all falling on the subject. And the way that one of the techniques for doing that is to go for not a middle of the road aperture, but to put the camera on what's referred to as aperture priority and really close it down. So it's just a tiny little opening. So in this case, this is about a, an aperture of F22. What that means is if then I open the flash of the camera, that basically all of the light that's available to light this scene, to expose the sensor is provided by that flash. And one of the characteristics of a, an external light source like a flash is that it actually doesn't penetrate the world very far. You know, it's subject to the inverse square ratio. You know, when you sort of see a, a concert or a sporting event where they'll look in the stadium and there'll be all of the phone cameras will be flashing away. It's the most futile thing on the planet um, because those flashes are doing absolutely nothing to light their subject. They, they're effective out to a couple of meters at most. Um, so what I've done in this image is to actually pop the flash on the camera, use that flash to light the waratah, and it's just cast the rest of the image into the dark. So you're really concentrating on your subject. Um, this one's a mixture of doing that. Now you see that there's actually this bright lay, this bright rim on the leaf. That's because this is actually in full sun. So even though the background looks uh, dark, you can see that it's actually in full sun, but I've overpowered the sun with a small aperture and that fill light. And it allows you to see this extraordinary detail on the flower that really wouldn't otherwise be apparent. Um, in this case, I've wanted to get more than one Waratah into the image. So what I've used is a 
wide angle lens, a 20 mil lens, so that I'm actually only probably 15 centimeters from this plant, but because the, the, the lens I've used is so wide, it's allowed me to not only get the, the Waratah, um, the main subject, but also pick up this second one. And in fact, when you're using something like a 20 millimeter lens, one of the tricks you have to follow is to always make sure that you can't see your own feet because they're so wide that you'll often get parts of yourself in the image as well, which you probably want to avoid, especially if you're wearing the daggy jumper that I am at the moment. Um, this one, I wanted a bit of the background so the aperture is not cut down quite as far. This was about an F11. But as you can see, most of the light is coming from that flash, but it allows me to actually pick up both of the Waratahs. Um, one of the things that you, that, that's always worth keeping a lookout for is the situation where you just go that little step beyond the normal. So in this case, it's a Waratah, but it's a, I think it's a Howie or a Hardenbergia that was um, draped over it and climbing over it. So it just adds that little bit of extra. Uh, and for whatever reason, some of the, the individuals in that, in that um, cluster are, are much paler than the others. And so even though, like in pure aesthetic terms, I suspect the red ones are actually nicer looking, um, it's really hard not to pay a bit of attention to the ones that look a bit funny, basically. Uh, and in fact, I, I had a great time one morning just going and looking for the Mancius Waratahs. In this case, you know, with these things that they weren't stink bugs, stink bugs, but they look suspiciously like stink bugs. And as you can see, this one's a bit all over the place. Likewise, this one. You can also add another dimension to things by thinking about whether um, instead of presenting them in their full color, they may, they in a lot of cases, will work well in black and white, particularly when they've got strong graphic qualities. But the other thing we can do is to get really close. And one thing things that when you get really close, it's actually very hard to get everything in focus. So it concentrates the eye on those details. So this is the head of the Waratah. Likewise, this is the, the head of a Waratah in really tight. Same structure, but immediately after some rain. Even closer. One of the great things about a subject like Waratah is they actually, as the flower matures, it actually changes its structure and its form quite radically. So there's lots, lots of different things going on. And that's right up hard against the head. You don't, in, in a lot of ways, you, you, you probably wouldn't even think it was a Waratah. And that one looks more like hot cross buns than a, plate, a plant, but that's what it is. All right. I'll just go back there for a moment. So look, the reason that I've, I've gone through that sequence is that it's really easy to think that creativity and seeing something different all has to rest on having lots of gear and different gear. But the reality is that you can take these basic cameras and it's really up to you to think about ways of actually seeing them in a different way. And personally, I get as much pleasure out of that, that process of taking something that's really familiar and looking at in different ways as I do um, anything that's new. Um, the, the reality is there's so much complexity right in front of us that you know I take it as a challenge to try and unpack it as much as I possibly can. And especially during times when we're so constrained about moving, um, there's a joy to be had in that complexity and diversity. All right, so look, what I want to do now is just sort of run through some of the major genres in nature photography, and we're, we're, we're into the last few minutes, so I'll be going reasonably quickly. Um, and this is, again, uber local, um, but in my world, this is Camo Botany Bay National Park on a day that I think the way Rider Boys was suggesting it was about five metres. So... This was all about trying to capture that energy of the waves coming into the, um, into the cliffs. And for me, monochrome worked in this case because it's all about those tones and that sort of power of the waves. Another local favourite spot, sort of Gary Beach. Um, 
it's it's a really good place to be at dawn because you can drive right up to it basically. Another view of Gary. So this last one, you can see that's that headland. So this is using a wide angle lens. And in this case, I've got the telephoto out and just really concentrating on the structure of those waves coming crashing into the beach. Uh, generally speaking, skies are really appealing to our eye, but you know, photographically, they need something to anchor them. Um, but occasionally it's sort of nice to break the rules and you know that band of cloud over the sea really appealed. You can see I'm a bit of a junkie for big waves. There's just such something raw and every shot is absolutely unique. This is over at Guatemala. Uh, in this case, it was a uh, East Coast low. Another view of Gary Beach. So back to that theme of trying to maximize the diversity of what you're seeing. I, I, I should say that um, for me, the thing that made the big difference in landscape photography was finally making the decision that was worth carting the tripod around. Because remember I said about shutter speed being one of those variables you can control or you have to control. When you put a camera on a tripod, it suddenly allows you to use shutter speeds that you just can't get away with by hand. And as a consequence, the best times of the day from a light perspective are in the morning and the evening. Um, this one's in the evening. Uh, and you also get some really interesting effects. You can see that sort of blurring that happens with the waves by doing a long shutter speed. Um, this is down at Watermulla. Again, a very slow shutter speed. The entrance to the Clyde River at North Head. The, the thing I find endlessly fascinating with landscape photography as a sort of subset of nature photography is how places that are, can be pretty actually challenging to be in, there's just a serenity that comes from them when you actually capture them. Photographically, so this is a really long shutter speed, and as you can see, it's blurred what was a big sea into just this sort of milky cascade across the rocks. All right, so at landscape photography, you've got the sort of the, the slow end. This is wildlife photography. So in this case, there's a gamut that's just gone into the water, it's now taking off. Even at about a two thousandth of a second, the, the head is reasonably still, but you can see the wingtips are actually moving still. Um, one of the joys is things you don't actually see with your naked eye that are going on. And one of them is that seabirds, particularly terns, but also gannets are constantly actually flicking themselves to get that last little vestige of water off them. So in this case, you can see this one's flying along but it's actually twisted its head around and I'm still not sure if it's actually upside down. The turns will often end up upside down. So this previous one was all about freezing motion. You can also have a lot of fun with panning flying animals with a slow shutter speed. So this is an adult gannet in this case um, that I'm shooting at only about an eighth of a second. It does need a little bit of practice to track them so that you get at least something sharp. You're looking for at least a portion of it sharp to really work. Uh, rock warbler, which is the sort of the New South Wales state bird, the only endemic bird in New South Wales. Um, sometimes nature and human construction come together. In this case, this is down at Gary Beach again, but it's a, a little covey of brown quails set up in the car park. It's not the ideal background, but it's, it is what it is. <coughs> and again, sometimes the, um, the subjects don't necessarily small things like the quail. This is a, um, an Antarctic minke with its calf. That was just off Gary Headland. And an osprey down on the hacking. Uh, Gary, that's 15 minutes. No, that's... Thanks for that, Sam. No worries. So again, having to do really sh really fast shutter speed. Um, so if I was to blow this up, there's quite a lot of grain going on. Whereas in this case, uh, a little Nanking kestrel sitting on a grave, um, 
it was going to stay there all day as far as I could figure out. So I was able to brace it, put it on a tripod, um, and you end up with extraordinary detail going on. Uh, great egret. So big bird, little bird, middle-sized bird, uh, whistling kite, uh, white-cheeked honey eater. Uh, one of my favorites, 20 crowd honey eaters. I always thought that they were, there was lots of territorial fighting going on when you see them doing this sort of stuff, but also flying through the heathland, one only a couple of centimeters behind the tail of the other. Um, and I haven't included the shot, which is probably just a bit coy of me, but I actually finally realized having shot two of them mating that in fact it was courtship rather than territorial behavior that was going on. So again, one of those insights that you get from that ability to freeze motion in photography. This is a New Holland honey eater feeding off a Xanthria. Again, that's sort of frozen. You can see the tiny little thread of its tongue uh, going into those minuscule Xanthria flowers. Uh, but then you'll get something that'll happily sit and you can deal with its portrait as though it's a human portrait. This is the yellowtail black cocky and the other end of the yellowtail black cocky. Um, it's not a, not a fantastic shot, but for me, that personal connection never gets stronger than when a big animal is actually staring right at you. And um, if eagles can do anything, it's stare. Sometimes the personalities, you know, you, part of what you're trying to capture in photography is personality. And so in this case, you know, the, that, that chaotic um, way that lyre birds, you know, wander around, they sort of fluff themselves up, they sort of twist themselves around. Um, so a slow shutter speed worked in this case. But then, you know, the character of the white-faced heron is all about its extraordinary ability to um, forage along the coastal strip. In this case, it's got itself a little goby just before the wave swept in and got it. Or the little uh, redneck stints that are landing on the sand in front of me. Okay, so I'm actually not going to talk about the underwater stuff because that's probably, I think we had a, just, um, a presentation on that last week. And so I'm just going to very quickly run through that. But what I will say is, Digital cameras are just so damn good. And there's now so many small cameras that you can put in a house and quite inexpensively. And I can only encourage people to take the opportunity to experience a whole different world. It's a red Indian fish and red bull. Um, and that's a big blue groper and a little Eastern um, clingfish, which is, a, they, they take the parasites off bigger fish. And there's a, you know, there may not be lions on the Serengeti, but there is a bit of predation happens out there uh, and some of it by humans. A lot of parasites in the sea. It's a big isopod on a crimson bad address. Um, I'm going to finish the, this little section with three locals that are sort of endemic to our local area. So this is the, the Sydney Higby pipe horse, weedy sea dragon, and Bear Island Angler, which is actually pretty much restricted to the Sydney coastline and specifically um, uh, Botany Bay. All right. And look, I'm mindful that the time's there. So I was going to show you some macro stuff, but I'm going to, I think I'll bring that section to an end. And I just want to really quickly talk about my favorite, absolute favorite type of photography, which is not all these planty stuff. I've always avoided doing botanical stuff because I figured I'd have to learn the names and there's too many of them. Plants and fish are, uh, sorry, uh, fish and birds are easy, but plants are another thing altogether. Um, so look, it's probably exposing too much of myself, but, um, the next series are from my favorite rock on the Hacking River. Um, so I'm just going to say that quickly so you don't too think, think too much about what it means that someone's got a favorite rock. But it's that whole thing about having a tiny place that you actually explore 
Um, and in this case, it's a tiny little bit of the river, but I just love going back and seeing its different moods. And it's just, the, there's that extraordinary, it's, it's that slow energy of a river, the way it carves its way through the rock, the way it sculpts and shapes the place um, that I find really entrancing. Um, and it's that part of it is the really slow stuff that's going on, but then you've got this ephemeral thing, like the, like the leaf that for a, an hour or two is captured against the, the rock as the water flows over. And you know, it won't be there in a day, but it's just, um, it finishes the scene. All right, so I'm gonna leave this off at my rock. Um, so Shani, passing back to you, but I do wanna finish with, please, please, if you take anything out of this today, it's that don't let your views on the capabilities of your gear determine what you do. The reality is that the most basic equipment we all have available to us is extraordinarily capable and you have to do a huge amount of work to actually get to the boundaries of its capability. And most of us just don't have enough hours in the day, the week, the, the year, the life to do that. This is extraordinary. You know, we're a generation who's got an extraordinary opportunity to play with some really powerful ways of engaging with the world around us. And they, they are genuinely right there in your pocket right now. Thanks everyone. Wow, thank you so much, Gary, it was incredible. Um, now we'll just jump over to some of the questions. There's, there's a few questions here. So from Suzanne, um, what lens do you find you use the most often when walking in the bush and may need to capture a bird, et cetera, quickly? Um, look, if I think I'm going to be likely to capture, I'm gonna answer it slightly differently. This, this, I've made the decision that I'm prepared to cart around a bit of weight in my pack. So I have two lenses that I will normally carry. One is the stuff we talked about today, which is that sort of that moderate zoom. It's a mine's a 24 to 85. And that can get me in close to any of the sort of botanical stuff. That's great for capturing things like lizards. Um, but it's, um, it's really designed to, you know, either side of your natural eye. I'll also carry a telephoto lens. And my favorite is the, you know, I, I use Nikon. It's a 300 millimeter F4. It's a relatively light lens, so it's not a big burden. Um, but it allows you to get so much closer to small birds and distant whales, basically, which is where I seem to spend a lot of my time. So between those two lenses, I reckon I can cover 99% of situations. Alrighty, uh, the next question again from Suzanne. The nighttime shots you showed, were they taken with a flash? Was it on the camera or separate light source? And, and what does it do to the nocturnal fauna? Do they freeze or do they run? Um, I, look, I, there's two ways of doing it you can use a, for things that are likely to incline to stay still, um, you can just use a, an LED torch, but you've got to, in that situation, be on a tripod to be able to balance the sort of, you know, relatively slow shutter speed. I tend to use um, a flash. It'll usually be a pop-up flash rather than a, a big one. Um, the pop-up flash, the one that's attached to your camera doesn't produce anything like the same amount of light, but with high ISO, that's okay. What it does do is that nearly all nocturnal animals have a really reflective layer on their retina. Um, and so their eyes will actually look really pink. Um, in the case of koalas, they, they explode with light. They're just amazing. They sort of, they, they end up overwhelming the, 
the lens. So koalas, you, you've really got to use a lens off the camera to be able to adjust for that. But um, I tend to go into with Photoshop or Lightroom and just sort of turn that pink high a darker color. Um, my personal approach is that I will take, I will use the flash for nocturnal fauna, um, but it's not something I do very often. So I'm not going to go back to the squirrel gliders down the hill here and harass them every week. It's something I might do every two or three years. Um, so, you know, I've got those shots, but I'm not out there um, repeating them in the way that I'll be trying to refine many of my images of um, diurnal animals, uh, because you just you know that you're not going to have that impact. It's pretty much, for me, it's pretty much the same issue of, do you use callback for animals? And I'd much prefer not to, you don't want to intrude, but you know, it's about finding a bit of a balance. So another question on flashes. So this is from Bridget. Do you use a flash diffuser? Uh, depends on the, on the situation. Most of the speed lights, which are the common flashes that you can attach to a, an SLR camera, actually have a diffuser that you can pull down. Um, and as long as you're a couple of meters away, that's okay. Um, I do have, I'll just see if I can, no, I can't see it. Um, flash diffusers are one of those things that's really not worth buying. You can make a flash diffuser from everything from a sheet of baking paper to an ice cream lid. Um, just to let everyone know, it's just a way of softening the light. Instead of having the sort of a harsh, narrow flash, you want to have it sort of over a larger area. Um, I usually shoot in raw, so I'll even often actually put the flash up and just use my hand to bounce and then accept that there'll be a bit of a pink hue that I'll just deal with in um, post-production. For things like small insects, they're a really good idea because otherwise you'll, you'll get really sharp highlights on them. Um, but it's one of those things, don't overcook it. I mean, people will try to send you all these, sell you all these soft boxes and whatnot, and it's so easy to make a flash diffuser. You know, like I say, a bit of baking paper, a um, bit of alfoil, um, just try and make it so that the light's not going directly onto the subject. Ooh. Okay, so a question from Suzanne about the close-ups of the Waratah. She's asking, did you use a macro lens or extension lens slash tubes or both? Uh, most of the shots with the Waratah were actually taken with the 20 millimeter wide angle lens. And uh, one of the reasons that I've got that particular lens is that it'll let you get really close. Um, and then it's really good for environmental portraits because you get a lot of background in it. So most of them were in fact with the 20 mil lens. Um, there's a few of them that I did use the, I've got a 90 mil um, Tamron uh, macro, which is a you know, really, really sharp lens. You can pick them up quite cheaply. Um, both the Canon and the Nikon macro lenses are really expensive, but it's one of those places where the third party lenses are sort of cost, you know, between half and a third of the price and they're, they're very, very good. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm using there. Yeah. Um, okay, we've got a question from Graham. Can you explain white balance, please? Okay, so white balance is, relates to what's referred to as color temperature. And color temperature in its sort of in its in its purest form is the the intensity of sunlight that's coming through, but it's modified by the subjects that it's hitting. So um, you know when you 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 put on a pair of sunglasses and it doesn't just reduce the volume of light; it actually reduces the apparent color of it. And if you've ever had you know things like tinted um, brown sunglasses you take them off and you've got this weird sort of sepia tone going on in the world that takes your eye a few minutes to adjust the camera gets caught in the same way and so they actually have really good auto white balancing systems but sometimes it'll go a bit off and so um, any of the post-processing software will give the opportunity to tweak that white balance back to what you recall it looking like, or if you want to take it to a more extreme end, you can do that as well. Um, but it's 
it's easiest to just think about it as um, it's, a, it's a tint box and you make a decision whether you want to modify that tint or try to remove it to the extent that you can. Alrighty. Um, the next... current version of Camera Raw, which is the processor that sort of takes your files from any of the SLRs, it's really simple. It's sort of right at the top of the thing to, to adjust that white balance. Okay, next question from Sam about tripods. What tripod setup do you use for portability and stability? Um, tripods are, again, one of life's great compromises. I use a Monfrotto um, a 190X, which is about two, nearly three kilos. There's, um, when I bought it, it was one of those things where the carbon fiber version of exactly the same tripod um, weighed a kilo less and it was literally twice the price and yeah I wish that I'd walked out for the more expensive <laughs> tripod to save that kilo. Um, having said that once you get into the habit of using a tripod it just offers you so much in terms of you know the landscape side of things in particular because you know the reality is that hills and ridges and um, valleys don't move around much. And so, you know, it, it's all about stabilizing the camera. It's not as though you've got subject blur. Um, the very most expensive tripods, you know, things like Gitso um, and really right stuff, they still only get down to about a, ki a kilo and a half. So they're still pretty expensive. They're still pretty heavy and they become really, really expensive. I, I spent far too much time up to my knees in mangrove swamps to have a tripod that, um, you know, cost $1,500 basically. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd rather have to replace one every sort of 10 years um, as it sort of erodes away. So a bit of horses for courses. Okay. Um... Okay, the next question's on software. So do you use, do you do much adjustment with the software? And if so, what software do you use most often? Um, uh, look, I personally, my, my workflow is I, I don't use Lightroom uh, because it, when I tried to use Lightroom, I found myself whipping over to Photoshop too often for um, area-specific or non-destructive changes, and that's a little bit harder in Lightroom, or it certainly was when I was using it. So I, I use um, Adobe Bridge to sort of access and organize my files. It's really just a, it's essentially a catalog that also makes it easy to open them up. And then Photoshop. Um, most of what you traditionally did in Lightroom, you actually can now do in the Adobe Raw Converter that any file will open up initially when you're bringing it into Photoshop. Um, where Photoshop really shines is where you're trying to do area specific adjustments. So things like lifting shadows or, you know, um, if there's an area where you want to brighten or dull the, the image, it's really useful there. Um, but look, to be honest, it's really just what you get used to. They're, they're, they're all monsters. Um, something like GIMP is, it's not as good as Photoshop, but it's 90% as good as Photoshop and it doesn't cost you anything. Uh, and it's a really powerful editing program. Um, and all of the cameras actually come with the proprietary um, programs that Canon and Nikon and Sony will provide for basic photo editing as well. So it's more about getting a handle on how much time you want to put into modifying those images and getting them as close as possible to what you recall. The thing to remember is if, that if you're shooting in raw, it's a really flat presentation of the light that's coming onto that sensor. It's not actually how your brain sees things because our brains are constantly raising shadows and reducing sort of highlights. And so at an absolute minimum, you need to go through and do those basic contrast adjustments. Okay, uh, the next question from Nigel. How do you remove red eye from possums or gliders which seem to bounce light back as white green light? As a white yeah. green light. So what I'll do is um, I'll, I'll open the file in Photoshop. I'll select the eye, uh, put an adjustment layer on that, and then I will convert that to black and white. 
just that area of the eye to black and white. Um, it works a dream. Okay, next question, Charmaine. People put filters on their lens. Why would they, why and would they help nature photography? Okay, back in the film days, people used a lot of filters to block out particular wavelengths of light. At one extreme, you had things like infrared filters, um, which actually nowadays are an adjustment to your sensor, um, which preferentially directs infrared light, but you could also remove the reds or the blues. It was particularly used for monochrome photography, for black and white photography to, for instance, increase the contrast between blue sky and white clouds. Um, by using a, a filter, you'd actually maximize that change. That style of tinted filter is pretty much irrelevant with digital photography because you can do that all through the adjustment of the file, um, whether through that white balance or through a variety of different adjustments. So I don't tend to use, well, I, I don't use any tinted filters. What I do use quite regularly is what's called a polarizing filter. Um, and that is really is genuinely exactly the same as a polarizing set of glasses. It actually removes the, the scattered um, light that's coming through and restricts it to a particular polarity, a particular direction. It's helpful when you're photographing around water um, in that you'll be able to reduce the glare. But where I actually find it sad it's most helpful is in deep forests, you know, in the rainforest, because leaves, particularly um, uh, rainforest leaves, are surprisingly reflective and it allows you to actually remove some of the glare and bring out the natural colour of the leaves. So a circular polarising filter is really useful. The other ones that um, are worth thinking about for artistic effect are um, a neutral density filter. And that's really just a really heavy set of sunglasses. So it reduces the amount of light coming on. And because it's reducing the amount of light coming on, think back to the exposure triangle. Um, one of the ways of adjusting that is to actually allow for a really, really long shutter speed. And that's where you get that blurring out of water in waterfalls or seascapes. Um, it allows you to produce a very, very long, um, very, very long exposure. Okay, we're getting down to the last couple of questions. Um, so from Suzanne, why do you shoot in raw? Um, Look, I probably shouldn't in truth. The algorithm that sits behind the JPEG is really, really good. Um, and most of the time will do the job far easier than anyone figuring around in RAW will. In RAW, what you're trying to do is um, you're taking responsibility for all of those adjustments. The reason I do is, is partly that I might go out and shoot a few hundred images, but I've sort of, my personal rule is I try to actually cull them down when I come back so that there's only at most half a dozen that I'm keeping. Um, and then that then means I'm prepared to sort of work on each of those. What RAW will do is give you a lot more latitude for adjusting white balance, and it will give you a lot more latitude for lifting your shadows and reducing your highlights. Um, just because uh, a JPEG works on, oh, look, I, I'm, I'm not going to go actually into the, um, the technicalities, but a raw file's got vastly more information. And what it means is that it's essentially got more shades of gray. It's got more bit depth. And so you can make the adjustments much more subtly than you can with a JPEG. You know, with a JPEG, you've got a very granular sort of, picture, you know, the difference between white and black is far less than it is in a, in a raw file. So it just gives you more flexibility. But 99% of the time, you really don't need raw. All right, question from Peter. What system do you use for storing and cataloging your photos? I, look, I really like to use Bridge um, in part because Lightroom is an absolute fantastic system if you're totally invested in it. Um, but it 
concerns me that you do have to be totally invested in it. I like the fact that Bridge just lets me have, essentially lets me have files on the computer in the same way as I have for my work files or my sort of personal finances or whatever it be. And then I've got a particular um, filing hierarchy and Bridge makes it easy to access those and it operates seamlessly with Photoshop. You can just transfer files between the two really easily. The thing I like most about Bridge is that whereas with Lightroom, if you're bringing in say two or 300 images, um, it can take forever to that, for that to actually load into Lightroom and then you actually have to go through the culling process. Um, it takes seconds when you do it in Bridge and Bridge allows you to go through the same review process and I can delete you know, as I say, I try to delete sort of 95% of what I take, um, uh, or rather I try to get down to only half a dozen per session, um, and it just makes it really easy. All righty, final question. The polarizing filter, what effect does that have on sharpness? Um, if, it's, if the filter is grubby, it will detract from your sharpness. If you put a high quality polarizing filter on, um, it shouldn't have any impact on sharpness. But look, this is one of those things where you get what you pay for. So if you're, for instance, one of the common diameters is um, uh, 77 mils. And so I think a Hoya polarizing filter at that diameter, you know, you should be expecting to pay just over $100. Um, there's a really good Australian company up the North Coast called Earth, U-R-T-H, um, and they do a polarizing filter that's a bit cheaper than that. It's still not made in Australia, but they, they use, you know, recycled packaging and they have an um, a offsets program associated with all their sales. And yeah, I think their circular polarizing filters are about 70 bucks and they're just... You, you need to get something that's decent because otherwise you will end up degrading your images. But the good ones are worth it. All righty. Um, well, that's our final question. Um, that was a brilliant presentation, Gary. I'm sure you could have probably gone on and done a whole nother session on underwater and macro and other things. Um, so maybe we'll have that in the future. Um, but just letting everybody know next week, we have um, a webinar topic of urban forests with Ian McKenzie. Um, so you can actually catch our previous webinars if there's any that you've missed um, or you'd like to um, point them out to anyone else. Um, you can just jump on our website and find them all there. And we do periodically post on, on Facebook sort of our, our previous webinars, a link to that as well. All right, thanks for joining us everybody and we'll see you next week. <laughs>